Praise the Lord, and that is grace. A couple of things to note. First of all, we will be having a baptism today and a baby dedication. We'll be doing towards the, the very end of our service today, so I'll let you know that. Uh, sorry to get that word to some of the folks earlier about that, but on the baby dedication part, we'll give you time. If you did want to take your baby to the nursery, or, uh, you can do that, and we'll give you time to, to get your, your infant back in here before the, before the baby dedication time. But uh, we just returned, probably one of the most spectacular weekends we've witnessed in a long time around here with our men's retreat. How many of you men went? Give me an amen. amen. Oh, you can make more noise than that. How many of you men went? <laughs> it was quite a weekend. We had a great time in the Lord. God shows up. It's always great when he shows up. Amen. But it was a fantastic time in, in the Lord. It was just something that, uh, well, let some of these men tell you by, by themselves. Ask them how it went. And uh, what God did, you will see that the Lord really did do something that's it's, uh, very unique. When next year, when you're asked to go, we'll be having the same speaker that we had this year. We're, at least we're trying to work all the dates out for that now. We've got a commitment from him. We just need to work it out with the retreat center and all the other stuff that's involved. But uh, you do not want to miss this. This was a time of just uh, glory. It was really a time for men to be encouraged. And I don't know about you, I felt like I was sitting in the locker at halftime. We're down 10 points, you know. And somebody's... <laughs> Coach is kicking us in the butt, telling us, get out there and score. We can do it. We're going to win this game. Amen? <laughs> uh, the bottom, excuse me. Anyway, tell me you'll figure it out in a minute. We've been in a series of messages on the journey to the cross. We left off last week after the trials. And during that message, I mentioned that we would be talking about two events that happened as Jesus is leaving one of the trials and in, at the end of that trial, he's headed to another event that took place. One was the denial by Peter. You saw a little brief skit on. And then the other was the betrayal by Judas where he goes in and he's remorseful because he's seen what's taken place. And it was interesting how all this plays out. It obviously played out according to the word of God. Jesus had told the disciples everything that would take place. And there was still an, an unawareness on their part for whatever reason. And I know I can certainly relate to that. You probably will too, that God's told us what to expect. And we just act all surprised when, when something happens in the way which he, in which he described that it would happen. But uh, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm working here, but nothing's happening, you know. Uh, remember the Lord Jesus has, has, has stood before uh, the first of the tribunals when, but when Peter uh, denies him. The arrest has taken place. You knew what happened in the garden with the arrest, that uh, how that they came to Jesus and uh, to take him and how Peter responds and jumps out and wants to uh, defend the Lord and slices off the ear of Malchus. And we, we discussed those things last week. But as we go through this and we talk about the, uh, the, the, the trials, it was during the, the events of the trials that, that these, you're going to have to run from back there. Or maybe it's working now. I don't know. The Lord endured six different trials before he was condemned to be crucified. Remember we talked about three were before the Jews and then three were before the Roman authorities, before Herod, before Pilate. And then Pilate brings him back to, to speak to the Sanhedrin that last time. It was during the second Jewish trial that, the, uh, that, that Peter denied the Lord. His, uh, he was at Caiaphas' house. Remember how he goes to Caiaphas' palace, first trial there, stands before Annas. Then he's taken from there, and as he goes from there, he's bound up, being led by Romans, being read, led by the Jewish temple guard and others. They're going up to the temple for a secondary trial before the Sanhedrin, where he'll stand before Caiaphas himself. Annas is the father-in-law of Caiaphas. He, he goes and, you know, uh, has the Lord before him and asks him questions. He goes from there, as we say, from that place before Annas up to he's being led out of the courtyard. That's when Peter's final denials and he sees the Lord bound and says, and the Lord looked at Peter. The other betrayal happened when Judas is, you know, for whatever reason, has sold the Lord out for 30 pieces of silver. It's all been prearranged. He goes, as we said, to the garden, kisses Jesus, and that's that betrayer's kiss. And as he, as he goes back and follows the whole journey, he's kind of keeping up what's going on. He follows to the second trial where actually he stands, Jesus stands before the Sanhedrin. And that trial ends up with, uh, you know, with, with the remarks by the, the Sanhedrin saying that he should die. It's at that point, Judas has a little change of heart, throws the 30 pieces of silver. It's amazing that when Jesus stands before Caiaphas, we mentioned it last week during that secondary trial, that Caiaphas asked Jesus the question. It's like they brought all the false witnesses. Nobody was, nobody's story corroborated anybody else's story. Obviously, it was not sufficient to, to condemn Jesus on any basis whatsoever. And then in the heart of the mind comes this brilliant question based out of a prophetic prophecy in Daniel that, that Jesus is asked by the high priest. 
the high priest asked him, well, are you that one, the Christ, the Son of God, who should come? See, Daniel makes reference to this when Daniel says in prophecy about the moment of the Lord Jesus returning and coming back in glory, he says, you know, there's one who will come, uh, the Son of God who will come, the Christ, and stand before the Ancient of Days, and the Ancient of Days will give unto him all dominion and all authority, and you will see him come as the Son of Man, Son of God, in clouds of glory. That's that whole little passage from Daniel 7, 30, 31, 32, 33, right in there. Well, Caiaphas is taking that little bit of prophetic scripture. Are you the guy? Are you the one? And Jesus says, you said it, and fin finishes the scripture he's referencing. And hereafter shall you see the Son of Man coming in clouds of glory. At that point, he tears his robe, which we talked about last week, the symbolizing the end of that high priestly ministry. He tears his robe and cries blasphemy and says he's worthy of death. And they all chime in. That's when Judas sees what's going on. He, he, they're going to kill him. Now, you know, and I don't think that really entered into the heart and mind of Jesus. I really thought he was going to put Jesus on the spot and make him take a stand as the, as the Messiah. Whatever was in his mind, political, whatever, we don't know. Obviously, we know there's a spiritual entity working here. And Satan has entered the heart of Judas. And Judas is remorseful. And he takes the 30 pieces of silver upon hearing that judgment and throws it into the temple. The priests gather the money up. They can't use it in the temple because it's blood money. And later it is used to buy potter's field, which the place is where Judas goes from there and hangs himself in Potter's Field. And so this is all the events that happened during those trials with these two men, Peter and Judas. And today in looking at them, I really want to, to overview some of that activity. Remember, first of all, it was Peter. And you see him denying the Lord three times. If you study the Gospels clearly and you harmonize them, you'll see that one Gospel gives a little more insight than the other Gospel, where one Gospel talks about the cock crowing, the rooster crowing, Mark, I believe it is, talks about him crowing twice, and the Lord is very specific. Before the, before the rooster crows twice, you, you will deny me three times. Very specific that he tells him. But how did all this happen? How does Peter come to the place where one moment he's moving forward in courage and zeal, and he's telling him, I'm not going to deny you. I'll go to the death with you. And the next moment you see him denying the Lord Jesus Christ. How does it happen? Well, let me just say, first of all, it happens because I don't believe Peter took the, the warning of the Lord very seriously. The Lord has specifically told him, you know, when Peter said, even though all may fail, fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples chimed in and said, us too. <laughs> I all said, We're gonna, we'll die with you. And Jesus said, you're not going to die with me. He told them what was going to happen. And they just, did, they just you know, they didn't pay attention to what the Lord was saying. Another thing, a reason the way it happens, the way it happens, Peter didn't watch and pray when the Lord had instructed him in the garden. Remember in Mark, we talked about when he was in Gethsemane two sermons ago, the Lord came and found them sleeping when he told them to watch and pray. And he said, Simon... Are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. For all his courage, for all his zeal, for all his empathy for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you look at Simon Peter, you see he is absolutely unprepared for everything that's getting ready to go on. He's just not ready for it. And the reason he's not ready for it is because he didn't do what the Lord had told him to do. He should have been watching, he should have been vigilant, and he should have been praying. And that's the, that's the average Christian today, though. We're so caught by surprise at the events around us, and much of it gets back to the fact we're just not really being vigilant, we're not being diligent, we're not praying, we're caught off guard, we're easily seduced by Satan's forces, we, we fall prey to the fiery darts of, of hell, as the Bible talks about. We're not lifting up our sword in the Word, we're not lifting up our shield. You know, and we're just caught all aware. And what we do is we end up living, you know, as reactors to life and to the Word of God, to the will of God, to the circumstances of life. We just have something happen. We, we, we react. Oh, yeah. You know, somebody says, where are you? Situation occurs. I don't know. We just start doing stuff because we don't know what to do. Because we're not ready for anything to happen in our life. The Bible says, you know, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Trials are going to come. Trouble's going to come. But you always see Jesus telling disciples, remember, you need to be praying. You know, and here's the way you pray and instruct them in prayer. 
So his, his, the problem here is he's reacting even to the sword pulled out and cutting off Malchus' ear because he wasn't responding, because he wasn't watching, because he wasn't praying. And he was, every time something would come up on the horizon, he'd just freak out in this regard. And this is what happens. The third reason for all this happening was because, you know, as, remember it says, as Jesus was loud out of the garden, in Luke 22 it says, and Peter followed afar off. Now, there's been a lot of sermons in regard to Peter following afar off, and a lot of pastors and teachers have criticized him for walking at a distance. But please understand, Peter was not intended to follow at all. It wasn't, God had already told them, the Lord had spoken to them, here's what's going to happen, here's what I want you to do. I mean, he told them what was coming. He, he gave them specifics, and he gave them instruction about what they were supposed to do, and they weren't ready for it. The Bible tells us that the sheep were supposed to scatter and then they would all meet Jesus later in Galilee. But that's not what they did. That's not what happened. Matthew 26, 31 says, you know, you know when, when the sheep are scattered, hey, then you go up, I'll meet you in Galilee. In fact, when Jesus was in the garden, remember, what did he tell the guards when they came to arrest him? He says, you know, you let them go their way. Let them go their way. It's so amazing that they not only did not do what the Lord said to, the Lord had to come meet him in the upper room and tell him, go to Galilee. <laughs> Later he has to give instructions, I'll meet you in Galilee, give the instructions. But they should have been on their way to Galilee to start with. Not hanging around, not following at a distance. The Bible says that Peter and John followed the mob, the, the crowd that had come to arrest Jesus. And ultimately they, they kind of walked into the entrance of Caiaphas' courtyard. And there they were. In John 18, it talks about how they're gathered there and, and they're there in the cold of the night uh, watching the events that are taking place. In fact, they're, you know, they gather, they're gathered around the fire because it's a cold night. Even though it's a cold night, in fact, it was even in the spring and summertime, it gets very cold in Jerusalem at night especially if you're anywhere near the fall in the winter. It gets cold. For those who've been there with me, one of the things we like to do when, we're, when it's ever possible is we, the last night in Jerusalem, we all come out and get on the bus in the evening and we ride back up to the Mount of Olives and we have a little service and a little prayer time up there and we always last words out, take a jacket. <laughs> Because that wind comes right up the Mount of Olives and it is cool breezes and it is quite chilling to the bone. But it's a spectacular view. And you think about the Lord Jesus sitting that night there and saying, you know, woe unto you, Jerusalem. You know, how often have the prophets come to you? How often would I have gathered you under my wings like a mother hen? But you would not. Woe to you, Jerusalem, who stones the, and kills the prophets. So here's the Lord Jesus. He's been in Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives sweating. Great drops of blood. They're now at the Caiaphas' courtyard. And the Bible says that first of all, in John 18, they stood by the fire. And as you follow the story, and I says, well, you line up gospel to gospel, a little while later in Luke 22, around verse 55, it says, then they sat down with the servants. They came in, followed afar, and now they're sitting in enemy territory. Now, obviously, Peter's not where he's supposed to be, and now he's an easy target. And so do we become easy targets for the enemy. You know, at our men's retreat, the brother who preached to us, Neil Jeffries, was sharing an illustration about the roaring lion looking for someone he may devour. Well, boy, they walked right into the, the lion's den right then and there. And Satan is always looking for Christians who are unaware, not prayed up, not keeping watch, not being vigilant, not listening to the Word of God to destroy their lives. It's dangerous territory. And while he's sitting there and comfing up to his, his fire and getting comfortable with the enemy, his master is being accused, his master is being abused and being, being sought out to be destroyed. The, the actual denial starts like this. First, there was this high priest servant girl who challenged Peter and she accused him of uh, being with Jesus and being one of the disciples. Peter said to him, woman, you know, uh, I am not one of his disciples. That's pretty clear, isn't it? I do not know him. I don't know what you are talking about. How do you get from cutting off an ear to defending Jesus to slowly going on and, and then kind of following along with the devil's crowd? He's not supposed to be there first and foremost, amen. <laughs> He's supposed to have gone. But, you know, here he is now. He, he, he left the fire when she says this, and he goes over to the porch of Matthew 26, and then all of a sudden, as Jesus prophesied and marked that the, that the rooster would crow twice, 
The rooster crows the first time in Mark 14, 68. Now, folks, I don't know, you know, if you've grown out in the country or not around roosters or not. Roosters crow right at sunrise, right? Right before the sun makes its roof. We're still a couple of hours out. We're at the first trial. Jesus in Gethsemane. It is, it is hours right now before the dawn. And the rooster crows the first time. That should have been warning enough for Peter to say, it's time to get out of Dodge. <laughs> but he doesn't. He lingers. The second thing, you know, is it's, the Bible says he, would let, he went, to the fire, went to the porch and the cock crows up for the first time. And the second now moment of denial comes when the second servant girl uh, told the bystanders that were standing around. Peter goes over here. Oh, that guy, he, he's one of them. He, he was with Jesus of Nazareth. He's one of them. And for a second time, Peter declares, I am not, I don't know the man. The bystanders were not convinced. Especially, one of the bystanders who was there was one of Malchus's, the scripture tells us, remember Malchus, the ear cut off in the garden? One of his relatives showed up and asked, and asked this, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Surely you're one of them, others said. Surely you're one of them. I mean, the way you talk, and the Galileans had a distinct di dialect. I mean, you, know, you, you know folks from Texas and Louisiana. You can pick them out of the crowd, you know, pretty quick. Yeah, you're from Texas, aren't you? I, I, can, I can pick, you know. I knew when Lenny Zahn first came to church here and visited. You know. <laughs> he had a Texas sticker on his car, license plate. But, you know, he tried to tell me he's from the panhandle. <laughs> But his, his accent, his dialect, and we know around our country where people are from where they're not from, right? Margaret and Nicole is always fun to, to, to travel with her, and people say, where are you from? She says, Texas. You know her that whole hard German-Bulgarian accent she has. I, I'm from Texas. No, you're not. Yeah, I am. I'm <laughs> this accent gave me away. You're not going to get around this. It's just, I mean, you're a Galilean, I, we can tell. And at that point, third time, Peter uses an oath and says, I do not know the man. I don't know what you're talking about. And he cursed, basically. Now, here's a good sign. You ought not be cursing, gentlemen. The Bible didn't even record what the curse words were. <laughs> there's an oath. There's a curse. Whatever it means. He said, I don't know him. I don't know what you're talking about. It was then that the, that the cock crows, the rooster, for the second time, and the Lord's prediction, according to Mark 14, 30, is fulfilled at that mark. The Bible says in Mark 14, 30, Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. And at that moment, Jesus comes out of that first trial of Caiaphas' house to go up towards the temple, be led away up towards that place. He's in binds. And Peter looks at him, and Jesus looks at Peter, and their eyes meet. And at that moment, the Bible says, that look broke Peter's heart. Bystanders were watching Jesus go his way. Peter slips off, and he went off, and the Bible says, he wept bitterly. Say what you will about Peter, but praise the Lord. It was only a look from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all it took to bring him to the place of brokenness and repentance. So many times when God begins to deal with us, it's like a, a little first look into our hearts. How many times have you been set in, in, a, in a service in church and, and the Lord speaks something to you? And it's like the Lord just looks at you, you know, and you get that glimpse of Jesus and, and, and the heart begins to be stirred and conviction begins to happen. The Lord's moving. He's saying something to you. At that point, we either, we either open up, we, we let go, we let down the wall, we, we, we're going to do away with excuses, or, or, and we're going to let God speak to us, or we're going to say, I, I don't want to deal with that. I don't, I don't think about that. Uh, there's a voice, but I don't know who it is. <laughs> we're going to blame the preacher. That preacher's stepping on my toes. It's not the preacher. Amen. You know? It's the Spirit of God. It's, it's, it's like that little rooster crowing, cock a doo 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 Something in your heart. Not right with God. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and the Spirit of God speaks to our heart. And by the way, think about this. I mean, for one rooster to crow at night that early in the night, there's an element of miraculous to that, I think. Especially, he chimes in and all the other roosters in the city stay shut up. You know, he just crowing by himself out there. And every other bird in the community has got its mouth closed. And then, I mean, right there in that moment, he crows. 
And then as the moment goes and Peter goes over here and stands over by this fire and more accusation comes and he stands over here this fire and then they don't like what's there and, he's, and somebody else is coming in. He denied him a third time. And just as he finishes his word, I don't know him. I'm not very good at rooster calls. You know that. I don't hang around with roosters. Can you imagine the moment? Those words come ringing back into his ear. And the Lord steps out in that moment. Folks, that, that just the sovereignty of God. That's a sovereign moment. That's a, that, that's when, and, and that's, you know what a miracle really is? It's when the, the divine interrupts the, the human, all right? And God just takes over in this moment and, and, and causes things to happen. Like a rooster crowing. And you say, how did he do I don't know. Maybe an angel went over and plucked a feather. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> but whatever it was, it happened in time, just as Jesus prophesied it would, and it took place at the right moment that it should. And so you understand that, it, that, that, that there's a miraculous moment that's involved here. And I think it's important to, that, to understand that because that rooster and crowing just when it did at the right time as God had predicted that it would, that, that's a message. And it's a clear message, to, I, I believe, to the Lord, to, to, from the Lord to Peter as well as the church. I mean, it's more than just a miracle that fulfilled his words to Peter. I believe it was a message to Peter. And it, I, can, I believe it's even a message of encouragement to Peter in so many ways. Because remember, he's there in the whole scenario thing. He's heard every word the Lord has said. He knows what God had told him. And now he, he's at this point where all this has happened, that he heard would happen. And it's, there's got to be some element of encouragement and, and instruction and word from God in regard to all, to all that again. First of all, I think in several ways. One, I think it was an assurance. This is the way it encouraged him. There was an assurance that Jesus Christ who was still in control of everything, even though he's in bonds, even though he's a prisoner, even though he's a captive, seem, seemingly from the crowd looking on, they're pushing him, abusing him, slapping him, mocking him, but he's still in absolute control. So much so that nature is still obeying him. Peter, I mean, obviously anybody knew that uh, the Lord Jesus' capacity to have a authority over nature, he knew it. I mean, he, he remember the, 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 the draft of fishes on, on two occasions, the, the, the winds being settled, the, the waves, the, you know, when the Lord rebuked the wind and the waves, the, the Lord walking on the water, calling Peter to walk on the water with him. He'd seen the Lord's power over nature, over death, over disease. He'd seen the, the, the Lord's authority over demons. So now he witnesses, I believe, at the moment that's happening, you are God. You're God. And in that moment, in, in, the, in the power of that moment where Jesus literally steps out. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to take away from the fact that Peter is living in a dark moment here. This is a bad time for him. He's denied the Lord. And obviously, we know he loved Jesus deeply and dearly. This is a bad moment for him. But even in the despair of failure, in the despair of defeat, here is the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees him. The look, I don't think it's a look of arrogance. I don't think it's a look of rebuke. I think it's a look of authority. I think it's a look of passion and compassion for Peter. <laughs> Peter's rebelled. Here now is the crowing of the rooster. And I believe there's some element of assurance that Jesus is still Lord and Jesus is still sovereign. Second thing about this rooster crowing was it assured Peter that he could be forgiven. You know, he'd not, even though he'd not been paying attention, as we said, like he should, he'd not been watching, he'd not been praying. In fact, Peter had argued with the Lord about this whole thing, remember? You're going to, no, you're not. not we're not going to let it happen. And not only he argued with him, he disobeyed him. You're supposed to leave. Leave these people, let them go, go to Galilee. He didn't do that. In fact, he rushes ahead at his own whim because he's going to be zealous for the Lord. If we would just shut up sometime, <laughs> slow down, hear what God is saying to us, quit arguing with God over it, it's amazing what God might be able to do in our lives. But he doesn't. But then the Lord gives him this sign Remember back in Luke 22, this is all part of the, the, the final words to the disciples and specifically final words to Peter. And in Luke 22, the Lord is speaking to him and it says, the Lord, um, there is a, the, the, the Lord turned to him and he said to Peter, and he remembered the words of the Lord in 2260 when he says, looked at Peter and said, you remember the words Lord, he told him before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. 
And then in Luke 22, before that, where he told him that, he said, prior to telling him about the rooster, he said, Satan's asked permission to sift you like wheat. Satan wants to, 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 to destroy you. But basically, Jesus said, I'm going to let him come, but he's not going to be able to destroy you. Because you're going to go through this purging. You're going to go through this testing. There's going to be these trials. And, and but you're going to repent. You're going to fail. You're going to fail the test, but you're going to repent. And when you repent, I want you to strengthen your brothers. It, to me, you know, it, it, Peter's getting very thorough instruction about what's getting ready to happen. He's just ignoring the Lord. You're going to be sifted like wheat, Peter. And later he says, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows twice. Uh, we don't like those times when God actually allows situations in our lives, but you must understand that when those situations come, though you may argue about it like Peter did, you may try to rush ahead, you may try to avoid it, you, 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 you know, if you don't do and you don't listen, you don't hear what God says, you're going to find yourself in the same kind of position of failure in your life. You didn't listen to what God said, you didn't hear what God says, and you're going to fall flat on your proverbial spiritual face. It's going to be difficult. But if you'll hear what God says and you'll respond to what God says, you'll see the grace of God. And, and even in the fail, you come out of that knowing that God is faithful and knowing that God is good. And as Peter did, there'll be a brokenness and repentance. And he says, because the day's coming. And I believe Peter remembers these words with that cock crows second time. You're going to fail, but you're going to return. And I'm going to use you to restore the brethren. The third part about this rooster crowing, you know, told Peter, obviously, there's a new day dawning. I mean, that's what a rooster crows for, amen? There's a new day. There's a new start. There's a fresh new world upon you. You know, that's basically the context of what a rooster's crowing about. It, it wasn't a new day for Judas, obviously. It wasn't a new day for the enemies of the Lord. It wasn't going to be a new day for those who didn't care. But for those who would repent and those who respond, it's certainly going to be a new day for those. Remember, we just kind of saw in a skit we shared a while ago on resurrection morning. Remember, the angel came and gave a special message that should be in a message of encouragement when he said to the, the women, you go tell the disciples and Peter that I've risen from the dead. And then the Lord appears himself to Peter on that same day and restored him to fellowship. Now, I want to take a moment. And wrap this up with a very clear comparison between Peter's denial, brokenness, and repentance and Judas's denial, betrayal, brokenness, and non-repentance. Because it's important you understand. As you look at them side by side, you see, first of all, both men, they had opportunities to know right from wrong. I mean, they sat at the feet of Jesus. They were with him for three years. They saw the miracles. They heard the message. They, they saw the testimonies. They had the same opportunities. And you can look through the lines, and, and you can see both of them. And even Jesus giving Peter a, a, a place of authority and a position of the inner circle, and, but even Judas being given a place of privilege by, by carrying the treasures back. He didn't do that to try to trick him into something. It gave him an opportunity. They both made mistakes. They both sinned against the Lord. Peter and Judas were equally guilty. But we have to understand from a biblical perspective in relationship to God and our sin and God and our failures is, it's not necessarily who, who sins, but it's what we do with our sins. Because let me tell you, everybody sins. Even Christians sin. Christians mistake fail the Lord. Christians deny the Lord at times in their life. We all will, James in the scripture says, we all stumble in many ways. There's going to be failures in our life. They both made mistakes. Third thing, they were both warned. Matthew 26 and Luke 22. I know you're probably guilty as I have. You've studied the scriptures closely. When you look at these guys and you see all the warnings, you say, man, how can these guys be so stupid? You ever felt that way? <laughs> how can you be? He just told them you know, to go to Galilee, and he's still following. He just told him, you're going to deny me, and when he does, when he does, you're going to be broken. It shouldn't be a surprise, amen? But it wasn't until it all happened that he sees it, and he weeps bitterly over it all. They'd both been thoroughly warned of what was coming. They knew what, what, the, what was getting ready to happen. The fourth thing what you see in regard to him, they were both remorseful because of their sins. They felt sorry. They felt sad. They felt bad about their sins. A lot of people feel bad about their sins. 
And therein lies the big difference between these guys about being remorseful. Matthew 26, verse 75, puts it this way. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said. Maybe we need a new battery here, amen? Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Judas, he returns to the temple, throws the silver in, and then he goes out and he's remorseful and he's crying, but he hung himself. Same opportunities. Same, same kind of sins of denial. Both had been warned about these things and they both feel bad about what they've done. But what's the difference? The difference is, and the vast difference in between Judas and Peter is the remorseful repentance or, and, and how they responded after the sorrow and after the broken heart and after the, the crying here. They're both sorry for their sins. But here's the way 2 Corinthians puts it. It says, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. In other words, there's two kinds of sorrow. We feel sorry, we feel bad for it. Maybe you're sitting here today and you know you're not right with God and you know it's not right, you feel bad about it and you're sorrowful for it. Well, there's two ways in which this works. If all you have is a worldly sorrow, the sorrow of the world, you'll feel bad for it, but you won't genuinely stop and turn to Jesus and follow. You'll still embrace you may justify, you may rationalize. You may not even do the one of those. You, you may do the cowardly thing like Judas, you know. Uh, and, and, but uh, whatever it is in regard to this, if it's just worldly sorrow, it's just going to lead to death. If it's godly sorrow, a sorrow which says, Lord, God, I've failed, I've sinned, I know I've sinned, and there's, there's brokenness in your heart, and there's sorrow in your heart, but you're, you turn to Jesus. You don't turn to the darkness and you don't turn to the depression and you don't turn to the despair. You're not trying to make excuses. You're not trying to justify. You're not trying to hide it. You're just saying, God, I'm wrong. The Bible says he who uncovers his sin is going to be blessed and prosper, but he that covers his sin will not prosper. Not going to be blessed if you run around trying to hide your sin all the time. So Peter, he doesn't do that. He's broken. He doesn't try to hide his sin. Judas goes out, he takes his own life. He doesn't respond. Proverbs 28 says it this way, if you conceal your transgression, you will not prosper. But if you confess and forsake them, you find compassion. Luke 18, 13, that story of the Pharisee and the publican. Pharisees are all religious, but he's not repentant. The tax collector, the publican, he's sorrow. The Bible says the tax collector, standing a distance away, was unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, just beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And this is where Peter's at in his life right now. He's sorrowful what he's done. The other hand, there's Judas. The Bible said it had been better for him not to have been born. Why? Because he wasn't going to experience any genuine sorrow in his life. Real sorrow. Are we really sorry? Are we just sorry we got caught? I probably shared the illustration with you when growing up. You know, I grew up in a family of six kids. You ever seen the chicken soup commercial with a little kid sitting at the end of the table and all his brothers and sisters are sitting around it? And they switch now to Campbell's chicken noodle soup. And he's eating the chicken noodle soup from Campbell's. And, and he pokes up a spoon. And he looks at the family and says, I never knew there was chicken in here. Because everybody else got the chicken out before he got it. But Campbell's put enough in to cover it. Well, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of the way you feel. You better, especially with, you know, brothers and, and that mixture, you better grab your food fast. I'm not sure Christy's here. She'll tell you amen. You better grab it quick. My mama did something that didn't make a lot of sense to me when I was growing up with six kids, you know, and feeding kids like and all that. Uh, she, she would make cookies, and uh, she would ration them. <laughs> and I told my kids growing up, I was the original cookie monster. <laughs> there wasn't a cookie monster on TV when I was growing up, you know. I was the original cookie monster. I love cookies. Cookies, you know. And... <laughs> Real cookies. Now, I don't like these store-bought cookies, you know, the ones in the boxes, and they're dry, and they're hard, and they're crunchy. You know? yeah, that's, 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 that's crackers with sugar, okay? That's not really cookies, okay? I mean, they can stick the chocolate chips, and it's just it's not the real thing. Real cookies, out-of-the-oven cookies, you know, those oatmeal, raisin, walnut cookies, macadamia cookies, chocolate chip cookies, you know? That's real cookies. You know what I'm talking about? Any cookie monsters in the crowd? Cookies. That's the kind, fresh out of the oven. My wife still doesn't get it. She makes cookies that way sometimes. And I'm getting them right off the pan. I'm just, you know, eating them like that. They're just, you got to let them cool down. So, no. 
Real cookies are made to scald your mouth. <laughs> that old chocolate chip's still boiling. <laughs> cookies! <laughs> Good cookies, you know. Well, my mama would make cookies. And I'm not talking, you know, this slice off dough stuff. You can, I'll get by with that sometimes. Right? When a moment of desperation arrives, we'll use the, the, the refrigerated dough. But I'm talking about homemade stuff. Well, she'd make these homemade cookies, and she'd make enough for several times, you know, to serve cookies. Well, that's silly. You're going to make cookies, let's eat them. <laughs> so she'd set us all down, all six little brats, you know, sitting around the table with little cookies, and she'd give a couple, two, or three, if we're really good, three cookies per kid. And then she'd put the rest in a little jar, and she'd go hide it somewhere. She hid it somewhere because she knew I'd go looking for it. And she'd put them up. And she'd hide them away. And everybody would run out to play after we had our cookies. But not me. I'm chilling. I'm watching. I'm watching and praying, like the Bible says. <laughs> Lord, let me see where she puts them. <laughs> and sure enough, I would find out, even though she tried to change the hiding places on several occasions. And I'd be eating cookies. Not a cookie. I could double hand them. You know, cookies. And without fail, she would come into the kitchen, find me there, crumbs everywhere, chocolate chip all over my face, sitting on top of the kitchen counter, eating cookies. The look, I knew I was dead. <laughs> Are you in those cookies again? No, ma'am. <laughs> no, ma'am. Spitting out crumbs. No, ma'am. <laughs> I would pay the price, and I would say something like this as I was getting my whipping. I'll never do it again. I'm so sorry, I'll never do it again. I'd lie through my teeth. Because I love cookies. Let me tell you, folks, sometimes that's the way we do with God, isn't it? We just try to embrace our sin. Things that God said that are going to destroy our lives and ruin our life and lead us to death, we just continue to hold on to them and we make a wreck of our lives and everything else because we have a sorrowful sin we, and a sorrowful repentance, a sorrowful remorse, not genuine, heartbroken repentance. And here's the thing about it. If we just get right with God and really get sorrowful and broken for Him, it, it just changes everything. One day we're over here, we're justifying our sin. God's convicting us of our sin. The look didn't do. Now we got a word, and that didn't work. Now we're in a situation, God had to bring chastening in our life. That didn't work. Now we're in a real straight in our life. It's like our flesh is being touched, like the Lord's given us a real genuine spanking, and we're just suffering over it, and God's dealing with us, and we're still justifying. Well, I've, I've, everybody else, and I'm not so bad as so-and-so, but if I get right, somebody's going to find out about it, and they won't, and all that stuff, pride, 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 pride. It's all that yells. It's all about you. The drama we saw Jesus said, it's about me. Yeah. We just need to come and say, Lord, God, I'm guilty. God, I'm guilty. I was as a broken and a contrite heart. Thou wilt not despise, O Lord. Every one of us, folks, I'll wrap it up with this. At one time or another, we sin against the Lord. We fail him completely. And then we hear in some kind of fashion, some kind of way, cock a doodle doo. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. The flag comes up. The sound is clear. We've rebelled against God. That's when Satan comes in and tells us to justify it. That's when Satan comes in and tells us, you know, you're really done. You don't have a relationship with the Lord. Your future's gone. Your marriage is gone. Your life's messed up. You messed up. There's no way you can ever be any better. But that's Satan's only line. He's used it for centuries. When all the time Jesus comes and saying to me, all you that are heavy laden, come unto me. If you have a broken heart, come to me. If you're in failure and sin and defeat, come to me. I'll forgive you. I'll receive you. I love you. I'll cleanse you. You're my child. I'll make your life clean. I'll make you right with me. Peter, on the other hand, what does he do? He comes running to the Lord Jesus. His restoration is so complete that he was able to say to the Jewish leaders, you denied the Holy One and the Just One of Israel. You say, well, that's kind of arrogant. Here's the thing about sin. He gave them the opportunity, by the way, to respond. But the thing about sin is that we think it's all over. I've seen people do this with church members. Someone in the body of Christ fails miserably. They become susceptible and... 
they just deceived and they rebel against God and that leads to deep rebellion and it's a miserable mess. They make a mess, a big mess of their life, a wreck of things. And Satan says, oh, you saw, you got to let anybody know, all this and then just goes, this whole list of your life's over and the church just sees that sin and they say, oh, well, I can't believe those people. Like you're something special. I can't believe they did that. How many times have you failed Christ? The Bible says you restore your fallen brothers. You minister to them. You reach out to them. You love them. You care for them. You don't bury your wounded. Amen. And the Lord God stands mercifully, praise God and the Lamb, mercifully to restore us to the point he gives us authority to be able to address in others. Our failures become ministries. Our failures become an opportunity to say, you denied him, but here's what God can do. I denied him, but we're so afraid of being found out by God or somebody else or some other situation, we run from the light as though it were, were, it were God. We run to darkness. And God's calling us to himself. Yeah, I, I don't know about you. I'm glad. It's, sometimes I say, I'd really like to be living with Jesus on the earth. I think, I don't know. I might have a chapter. <laughs> there might be a section on my failure. There might, you know, I, you got, got, look at David, look at Job. I mean, listen, I mean, Job was a righteous man. Look, he's over there and, you know, talking about how, how good he is at the same time. And you go over here and you, you look at Peter and here's Paul, chief of sinners, thorn in his flesh. I mean, he's got, you know, you know and he just lists, I mean, failure after Noah, David, you know, Sam, Sam, uh, Samson, you know, on and on the list goes. But you know what? If we can see as they saw and respond in a righteous way, these are men we look up to, aren't they, in so many ways now? Their messages are shared constantly in churches for the last centuries as we've had the finalized Word of God. Your life will become a message. God will turn your failure into such a glorious first healing in your life, knowing that you can be forgiven and you can be cleansed, but out of that will come ministry to other people's lives. Don't run from the light. Don't run toward hell. Godly sorrow works repentance in life. Worldly sorrow, death. Judas went out and hung himself. You say, I'd never do that. Every time you say no to Jesus when he convicts your heart, you're hanging yourself. It may not happen suddenly, but it's happened a little bit every day after every day. Every time you say no, I don't respond. I'm, I, pride in his heart, you just kind of pull it a little tighter. Because the wages of sin is death. Would you stand with your head bowed today? I can only encourage you in the context.